Okay, guys, so this is a continuation for the firefighting system. This is part two. So we start off for the first part, which we understand what is about fire and then how the fire uh, move from one room to another room. And then now this is a part two, we start off uh, with the uh, source of ignition. So there's a lot of different kind of ignition in which fire can come from. Okay, first the source of ignition is uh, electrical. So electrical is for is a source of fire. There are five forms in which a fire can come from electricity. So the first is the resistance, second is arcing, third is sparkling, the fourth is a static electric charge, and the fifth is the lightning. So from the previous Part one, I think that there's a picture showing how resistance is being built in which the electricity is circuit is overloaded with a lot of circuit being run and then the resistance will overheat or the circuit component inside the circuit will overload due to very heavy loading drawing a lot of electricity. So in theory, we consider that most of the stuff that we have is 100% in, 100% out, which means that there's no wastage. But when you are using it in actual case, we are actually losing energy. That is the energy in which, in, in this case, the energy we are losing is some of the energy, which is the electricity, is lost due to it being converted to heat. So this heat is what will cause fire in our real world, uh, in practical. So, but in theory, we do not consider all these losses. So to make our calculation easier. So if you overload the circuit with a lot of component, with a lot of with a lot of component in a single circuit, then heat will be generated. As more and more heat is generated, then once you reach a point, then a fire will happen. Okay, so this is about resistance. Lah. So for arcing, so it says that when electro when electrical connection at switch or fuse is faulty, electrical energy may arc across. So this is shown that if you have a wire or you have a connection which is faulty, which means they are old or they are exposed, then electricity they might spark from a point different different point therefore C sparks appears due to high electric supply it is dangerous if combustible material is nearby so sparkling is due to not due to the electric circuit or wire not having insulation so when there's no insulation and you're running a very high energy electricity supply through the wire then electric sparkling will happen. So this ABC is all within a circuit. But for D, which is a static electric charge, so this is the, it happens on surface of different material in touch. So if we have ourselves and we are fully charged and then we go and touch a uh, metal, then we will release our static charge. So this is what happened in a, petrol station. If we are wearing jeans and we keep touching here and there, then we are actually charging ourselves with energy. And then if you are to actually go and touch the end of the petrol pump, then that is where an explosion will occur due to the static because the pump has a gas vapor from the gas. And then this is how an electric uh, fire occurred or explosion occur in the petrol station. Okay, yes, you need the declaration. Okay, so continue on for your experiment. You need your you need your declaration. So just put it at the end line for each of you guys. Okay, so this is how electricity will generate 
will be a source of ignition for fire. So next is a mechanical and nuclear. So mechanical is pretty simple. It happens due to the friction between two solids being wrapped together. And nuclear reaction is from the reaction, chemical reaction from the nu bomb, missile, torpedo, or nu nuclear explosion. Uh. So this one is due to chemical reaction. That's a source of ignition. Uh. Okay, so in a fire, although the end result is the same, but due to the source of the ignition, fire is actually classified into different different types. If you can see here, which is A, B, C, D, E, and F. So why is there a need to classify the fire? Due to the nature of the source of fuel, we are actually required to classify the fire. So this is due to, if you are to actually fight, fight all types of fire in the same way, so we may actually damage the stuff that we want to protect. So our, aid, our end game is not to just fight the fire, but we want to fight the fire in a safe manner. Particularly if you have a fire involving fats and cooking oil, in this case, you are not supposed to just fight it with a uh, simple of water. Like you need to involve a uh, sophistication of the fats and cooking oil. So there's a different different classes of this fire due to the different different source of fuel and ignition the fire is involved with. That's why fire is classified in A, B, C, D, E. So in A, the, the fire is involving with wood. So this is organic fire. B, fire involving flammable liquids or liquefied solid. So this is fire involving with the petroleum, petrol. So C is with flammable gas. So this is due to gases. D is flammable metal. So is sodium, potassium, magnesium. E is involving electronic equipment and risk of electrical shock. So not all the fire extinguishment method, which is water, is suitable for every cases of fire. Depending on what sort of fire ignition or what sort of fuel available surrounding the fire, you have to determine what is the most suitable method to fight the fire. For if a class A fire happened, which is involving wood, then you have no problem in using water. But if a class E or F happens and you use water, in the case of E, if you use water, you are going to spoil the electrical equipment, either that or you have a risk of electrical shock. Why? Because if you pour water on it, and then if it gets onto you and also the electrical equipment, then the there will be a short circuit of the electrical equipment and, it, and it's going to shock you up for, in the case of E. But why do I put emphasis on class F, which is fire in, involving fats and cooking oil? So this is very dangerous. If you have a fire involving fats and cooking oil, imagine if all of you, uh, not sure if all of you guys have cooked before. So if you are cooking before, if you actually put water onto oil, they are going to explode. But naturally, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at science, fats are less dense than water. So they, these two cannot be mixed together. So in a case where you heat up fats or the or there's a fire involving fats and you pour water to it. So the water is not going to directly uh, just dissolve into the fats, but the water is going to change its form from liquid into gas. So in a case where the water changes its form from liquid to gas, and then it comes into contact with fats, with all this extra surface area, of the water, 
when it comes to in contact with fats, then there is this danger of the water vapor exploding. So bear in mind that if you have a fire involving fats and cooking oil, you must not use water, plain old water to just pour into it. If you pour plain water into it, then it's going to explode. So moving on. So there's Fire Authority Act and Regulation. Okay. So in Malaysia, we have our bomba, and then its role is to fight and prevent fire. And then there's this three act, which is a Fire Service Act 1988, and then the Guide to Fire Protection in Malaysia. Then lastly is this Uniform Building by Law. So by now, you, I have mentioned this a few times, in regards to doing a building or anything regarding a building, this will always be there, which is a uniform building by law. So uh, you do not have to memorize all of this, but the most important thing to remember is this uniform building by law. Because any building you build, this is your Bible for everyone involved. Doesn't matter if you're a consultant, contractor, or client, or architect. This is the basic requirement to follow when you are doing a building or designing a building or building a building. If you do not follow this uniform building by law, then your by right, the authority will not approve your building plan and you will not be able to build up. But in Malaysia, we are, we are borderline, so we can do a lot of stuff. But this is by right, the most basic act in which all the architect before they before they pass the drawing to consultant to calculate out the consultant in this case is an engineer lah, civil engineer to calculate out the building they should follow so in this ubbl what how is it related to fire authority and act of regulation so it the requirement for UBBL is that there needs to be a passive fire protection and an active fire protection. In a case of active fire protection, this is means by uh, supplying a good uh, designing an area which gives access to fire staircase. So this is the uniform building by law for active fire protecting protection. Lah. So Passive is for the wall to be able to retain enough to, to be able to retain the fire in a single room and also the wall and the ceiling. So passive protection in a UVBL requires a thick enough wall, floor and ceiling and then there's also a firefighting door. So this is a basic requirement. And then the next is the active protection. So active protection requires a, fi a fire staircase to be within like 10 meters. So the info can be found easily inside the this and we are all, uh, all the building are required to follow this requirement. Okay, next is the principle of fire extinguisher. So this is four different kind of extinguisher from personal to to a more commercialized. So this is what you'll find the 600 gram will be what you'll find in your house lah, if you have bought one and the 9 kg is where you'll find in commercial area. Okay so basically there are two methods of fire extinguisher. One is cooling and another one is smoldering. So cooling is done by vaporizing the fire with water. When you vaporize the water, then it, the water will be able to absorb the heat and cool down the room, which is by cooling down the fire. And then they will prevent fire by taking out one of these components, which is heat. So 
the first method is cooling, which is using water and putting it into contact with fire. And as the fire heat up and vaporize the water, then it will absorb the heat of the fire. So this is the first method of fighting fire, which is by cooling. So the second method is by smoldering. So water is turned into a steam as it melts the fire. Its volumetic pressure increased about 1000 times. This saturation steam displays an equal amount of oxygen surrounding the fire. And this will in terms reduce the oxygen available to sustain the combustion. So cooling, remove the heat. Smoldering, they are to remove the oxygen. So one of these, uh, two of these methods, they are actually used to remove one of the component which is required in fire. Okay, there are a lot of media of fire extinguishment. So the first is water, which is readily available. And then the second is the foam. Third is gaseous medium. Fourth is the dry powder. And the last is the asbestos blanket. So why is there so many fire extinguishment method? Because we have fire is the same, but we have a lot of soft of ignition from a fire. As we previously covered in, in the fire classification, there's a lot of classes in fire. Why we want to identify the classes? Because we want to fight the fire efficiently. <coughs> so if you have water, no, do note that if you, are, if you were to use water to fight a fire, it's the most readily cheap, cheapest and available, but it will cause damage to our document and furniture and cannot be used on electrical fire. So in electrical fire, if you were to use water, as we were to fight the fire with the water, we can actually shock ourselves when it comes into contact with the electricity component. So the electricity will actually travel from the fire into our body as we are fighting fire. So it's always important. It's always important to identify what sort of fire it is. Then only we identify the method of extinguishment, which is either you use fire, uh, you use water, foam, gas, dry powder, or asbestos blanket. So the last one is a uh, a vessel's blanket. So it, in the name, there's a blanket. It's actually a small blanket to fight a small fire, mostly on kitchen. And then it can be used to wrap people whose clothes are on fire. So uh, a best, this blanket, if you have a small fire on the office or desk, is the best to be used because the coverage of the area is not big, so you just dump it onto a fire and then you remove the oxygen in it. So this is how a blanket will fight the fire. And then you have all this foam, gas and dry powder. So they are all, the method of extinguishment is basically taking out the either the three component or either one of the component inside a fire, which is the heat, oxygen, or the fuel. So mostly we are taking out the heat and the oxygen to fight the fire. So coming back to this fire execution method, we have A to F as seen here. And then on this table, on this third column, we have the extinguishment method, which is either by cooling or smoldering. So cooling, as I covered before, is by removing the heat, and smoldering is by remo removing the removing the oxygen. So for fire involving wood, cloth, and paper, which is the most common form, we can use both method of extinguishment method, which is cooling and smoldering. And then for the extinguishment agent, it can be anything. Lah. So water, foam, or dry powder. 
and then for B, C, D, and F, when you have fire involving gas, uh, petroleum, oil, grease, paint, and then this is flammable or liquid, or flammable gas, flammable metal, or electric equipment. So we will only apply the smoldering method, execution method. So we we'll want to just remove the oxygen. We do not want to touch the. We do not want to use a cooling extinguisher method. If you uh mostly for cooling extinguisher method, you have to apply water. So you do not want to apply water to this flammable liquid metal or material. If you were to apply water, you risk a case of explosion lah. You make the metals worse. So that's why you want to use either foam dry powder or CO2. So if you look at D, dry sand or is also an option because it's not something that is good as a fuel. That's why you may use a dry sand to cover up. So if you watch YouTube around, you notice that uh, when people are making metal works, they are actually using sand as a medium for them to pour the iron. So dry sand is a very good extinguishing agent if you can if you can find enough and you can have a a height for it to for you to pour down to cover the whole fire with it. Okay, the last is fire F, which is fire involving fats and cooking oil. So as I covered before, the extinguishing method is not cooling or smoldering. So you want to use spur uh, saponification. This is to turn the oil to soap. So the excretion agent is a wet chemical estimation. So you would not use water foam or dry powder or CO2. You The most effective method to fight a fire involving fats and cooking oil is to use the wet chemical estimation. This is by removing the fuel. Because you'll find that cooling and smoldering won't work, so uh, you won't use cooling because cooling is water. So if you pour water into fats and cooking oil, it's going to explode due to the water being heat up uh, extremely quickly. And then when it turns to vapor, it will just explode. And then you won't use these two methods. Lah. So smoldering isn't very effective against uh, fire involving fats and cooking oil. So the, mess, the best method is uh, wet chemical extinguisher. So you want to turn the fuel into soap. When the fuel is turned into soap, then you are effectively removing one of the components in the fire. In the fire. Okay. So there's Going back to this, which is a passive and active fire protection system, this is a, this is the general, which is a UBBL. So the objective of fire and protection and prevention is to provide the needed protection against fire for the occupant and properties inside and surrounding building. So leave safety, reduce the potential for injury or death. Life safety, so, sorry, this is not this. Life safety. And then property safety, reduce the potential for damage to building fabric and content, keeping the heat away from building. So, and then continue on. You want to continue the function of the building after, it, after the case of fire. And then you can repair any damages occur due to the fire and to remain safe for firefighting operation and consider the adjoining properties. So there are two methods which is passive and active. Okay, fire, passive fire protection is an all encompassing fire safety concept which embraces the passive measure in fire containment design. So it begins at the very early design stage. So this is where the UBBL come in. UBBL 
will have a requirement where all the buildings need to be this thick and as concrete is a natural deterrent against fire they are very good in containing fire so if you have a build, most of the building are built with concrete okay so this is built into the building a passive fire protection is built into the building and it should last the whole life of the building the objective of this fire protection system is to contain the fire or slowing the spread of it through fire resistant wall floor and door so as i said before all the wall floor they are made with concrete which is good against fire or high temperature and door should be fire rating it should be a fire rating door with a few layer which is good at resisting fire so you will install a door which is a wooden door and you do not apply any chemical or fire resistant epoxy to it then you will burn down very quickly which is not good lah. so to follow the requirement all the wall and floor is already have a certain great fire rating in place but for your door to follow the requirement you want to contain a fire in a single area then the main door has to be a fire rating door so this is a requirement actually in the UBBL the main door if you find in the hotel most of the hotel the main door is a fire resistant door but in your house the room which is partition or the door can be a normal door but because we do not want fire to spread from one area to another area and fire rating door isn't particularly cheap to be installed everywhere so by requirement a fire rating door needs to be installed at the main uh, at the main, as a main door okay so there's a reason why all this is in place this is to provide enough time for the occupant to exit or evacuate so how do they exit and evacuate in a case where a fire occur active fire protection system will activate first lah, which is a fire alarm where you'll find in your school or in commercial building if you have encountered it before so when the uh, alarm rings to indicate that there's a fire going on, everyone are to move out of the building in an orderly fashion. Lah. So for the first experiment, so it seems that I didn't read anyone who talk about leaf bomba. Lah. So one thing about leaf bomba, so this is just for information. One thing about leaf bomba is it's not for you to use during the case of fire so in the case of fire nobody is supposed to use the leaf you're supposed to use the emergency fire escape staircase that's why uh, emergency fire escape staircase is one of the passive fire protection system lah. so they are designed to withstand the fire which uh, they are designed to withstand the spread of fire so if you live in a condo or you have noticed in a high-rise building all the fire stack uh, fire staircase or the emergency staircase they are installed with a uh, fire rating with a proper fire rating door okay so this is to ensure that the fire do not burn into the fire staircase or the emergency staircase okay going back to the leaf so this is just for information lah. going back to the leaf uh during a fire the system should actually there should be a system in place to suspend the usage of fire so when there's a fire nobody should be using a leaf because if you're using a leaf you risk that the fire will damage the electrical component 
and it will jam the leaf. So it's always important to remember that in a fire, you do not use a leaf. But what happens, you'll notice that one thing in the leaf area, that there's this bomba leaf. So a bomba leaf is actually uh, just for bomba to use in the case of them wanting to go to the source of fire, which is from ground floor to the particular leaf, to the particular floor the fire occurs. So that's why there's this bomba leaf. The function is just to go up to the floor that the fire happened for the firefighter to fight the fire effectively. So in remember, in a case where a fire happens, nobody is allowed to use the leaf except for firefighters, which is a bomba. And when a fire happens, everyone is to proceed to the fire staircase and to exit the building. So you are not to just take the leaf and go down. By right, the control system of the building, they should, uh, there's a system in place that would have suspended all the usage of leaf. That's why you will not be able to access the leaf, la, even if you want to. So this is just for information. La. Your leaf is not meant to be used when, it's, when there's a fire occurring. Okay, Go, coming back to the passive fire protection. So the passive fire protection, which is to be built into the building, which lasts a lifetime, do not need power and water to operate in case of fire. So the concept of this passive fire protection is fire containment and means of escape and egress. So this is in and out. Lah. So fire containment by means of the wall, floor, and door. And then means of escape, this is your fire staircase. So how does passive fire protection works? It works when a uh, fire occurs in an area. The building is designed in, a, in such a way that when a fire occurs in a particular area, the walls, floor, and door are all designed to contain this fire inside the area for at least two to three hours. And then within that two to three hours, you are, all the occupants in the building are supposed to just exit the building. Okay, fire containment. So the idea is to contain the fire at the source of the area of where it occurs. And then is to prevent the rate of fire and smoke spread that will overtake the occupant ex escape rate. In a fire containment design of a building, the space of a building is subdivided into compartment according to their intended use. So this is what it means by dividing the building into different different area. So in this different different area, when a fire occur in that area, the fire will only spread within that area. Once it spread within that area, they will need to fight off. They will need to burn off the fire protection system in place, which is the wall, floor, or fire door. So once they burn through this three component, then the fire will start to spread to other area. Okay, so this is the UBBL requirement. Party wall generally should not be less than 200 mm total thickness of solid, masonry, or in situ concrete. So in situ concrete is concrete, lah. so masonry is brickwork. So this is brickwork. Just for your info. Lah. Okay, so means of escape. So this is the explanation for the B. Occupant must be able to escape without being rescued. So this is important. You do not want to build a building which occupant will have a hard time in finding the emergency escape. So if in the hotel, if you stay in the hotel before or the means of escape 
will, should always be displayed on the wall or on the door. This is in case a fire occurs, then you will know where to go. Either that or outside, there's uh, this assembly area sign signage. So when a fire occurs, you'll know where to assemble and there'll be a headcount to find out who, who, who's, who's the occupant who should be working in the building that has escaped safely out of the building. And then the escape route shall be the shortest route to a place of safety. So this escape route, which is from an area you're at to the emergency staircase or the fire staircase, and then out of the building. So this one have to be short. In the UVBL, there's a requirement that the fire staircase cannot be too far from the from your area. So the building is actually constrained by where you place your fire staircase. Okay, if possible, alternative means of escape shall be provided. So if you have a very, very large area in the case of a shopping mall, although uh, if you do not notice it, there's actually a lot of fire at uh, fire staircase all over the building. So this is actually to provide an alternate means of escape for you if a fire actually occurs in a shopping mall. All these fire escape staircase will be accessible and then it's for you to go out of the building. So you next time when you walk around in the shopping mall, you notice that there will be a lot of door and there will be a small signage saying that this is a fire escape door. So you just take note of that like, when you walk around a shopping mall. So here it says that in a large complex, the road instead can lead to the protected staircase, corridor and later to final ex exit. So the means of escape can be considered of unprotected area leading to direct exit or protected area leading to direct exit. So protected area must be free of combustible material. What it means here is that all the staircase, there must not be any combustible material. So if you have this combustible material, then no point you install all these passive fire protection system in place. Okay, active fire protection. So that's all about passive, which is to prevent. Active is actually essentially to fight the fire instead of containment. So passive is containment of fire. Active is essentially concerned with fire extinguishment. So active measures are those which require some form of communication to occur by informing people or equipment of the presence of fire and instructing them to take action to contain its spread. So active fire protection is firefighting instead of containment. So the first is the portable fire extinguisher. So this portable fire extinguisher, you will find it near exit and they will be indicated. So this is to prevent in the case of fire before it goes any bigger. A portable fire extinguisher is good enough to fight the fire in the early stage of fire lah, to prevent it from going to massive scale or to full scale. So this is the different different type. They are all labeled in a red can. And then what sort of material inside the fire extinguisher they are actually labeled. So a uh, water, they will be labeled water, foam, powdered carbon dioxide and then a wet chemical. Okay, other than that is the external fire hydrant. So this is a source of water which is provided for firefighter to fight. So it's a water tap lah, which is your, you will find outside the red color water tap. Next is the host rear system. So this is what you will find at the staircase. So if you live in a condo, you or uh, if you see around the car, you see there's actually this square box. Inside there's a host wheel system. So inside this host wheel system, you are to 
actually connected it to the different different host and then connected it to the fire uh, water which is to fight the fire so all of these are requirement by UBBLC. It, there's a lot of requirement which the which needs to be followed this is all for safety sake that's why there's a law for it so all these are requirement as required as required <coughs> so this is the host reel this is how uh, the component for the host reel there will be a <coughs> host to it usually this is closed off in a box so why they want to close off in a box is to prevent the nature taking effect into this and decaying the component lah. so usually this is closed off in a box lah. <coughs> okay next is the dry riser system so a dry riser system is a form of internal hydrant for the fire fireman to use in a building so there will be a dry riser installed in a building and then you have a fire truck so to so uh to effectively fight a fire in a building or this is not a big fire which is a small fire that occurs in a building instead of the firefighter carrying the water to this floor they can just connect their vehicle which already stored the water to this dry riser so what will happen is once it's connected and the fireman is already at the floor where the fire occurs they just connect their hose and they open the tap here and then they are actually able to fight the fire using the water that they have here so a dry riser is essentially this is uh, just a empty tap there will not be any water the bomba need to attach this hose and provide the water so it's required by law to either install a dry riser system or a wet riser system. So a wet riser system works the same as a dry riser system. Instead of having a bomba which is filled with water connected to this system, they actually have a water tank and a pump to drive all the water up to the high rise building. So the firefighter have an easy time. They just connect the hose to the wet riser and then they can just fight the water so it's required by law UBBL to either install the wet riser system or a dry riser system so all of these are additional information lah for you to read through okay next is the automatic sprinkler system so this system is to operate automatically instead of our intervention so the sprinkler head has a liquid filled glass bulb that break due to the heat of the fire and release water that spread over the fire so this water sprinkler system is actually all automatic and they has they have this glass bulb here which have a different different rating and then different different color to indicate at what temperature this glass bulb will break and release the water pressure here so once this once the heat react with this glass bulb and break the water then they are the water will flow out and effectively fight the the fire so it's required by law to install a water sprinkler okay the important thing is this is designed to detect control extinguish fire and one occupant of the fire so once a sprinkler system is activated it should actually send a signal to the control room to ring the fire alarm bell to tell the occupant of the building to get out of the building so it's not only to fight the fire but 
this is also linked to a system which in turns notice that the sprinkler has activated in the control room and then they will in terms ring the fire alarm okay for this sprinkler system previously there's a table which states that at different different temperature the sprinkler system will activate so depending on the nature of the building either they are extra light ordinary hazard or extra hazard there will be different different rate, uh, rating of the bulb at for different sort of building they are in if you are at light hazard you will not require such a high la, such a high bulb rating and then ordinary hazard and extra hazard so how this building are categorized is according to what sort of uh, nature of usage they are at if they have if they are something like a school which uh which not which do not have a lot of combustible then is categorized as light hazard if they have a lot of hazard which means they are dealing with a lot of things that can burn in, in example which is a paint and varnish factory so this product is a flammable product and when you're working with flammable product the building should actually be categorized as extra hazard high hazard so there's this uh, word which is missing which is fire extra high hazard fire happening so you think of it this way when there's a lot of component inside or a lot of fuel which can fuel uh which can easily fuel a fire then the building should be categorized as extra high hazard so in a extra high hazard you need to have more fire protection system in place okay so this is a sprinkler head arrangement and spacing so depending on how light or how high the hazard is if you if the hazard is very light you do not need to install so many sprinkler but if there's a very high hazard then when a fire occurs it will grow very very big that's why you need to have more sprinklers to fight the fire so this is just the value to it lah. so if you are tested in this the this this arrangement and spacing requirement this will be given lah, for the calculation question so for example one we are actually to calculate the number of sprinkler head for a normal factory with a floor area of 20 times 10 meter so do take note uh i just found out that the answer is not in so i won't be uploading this slide but just take note on this calculation lah, how to get the answer so it's pretty straightforward you have this sprinkler head arrangement and spacing requirement and then there's this the normal factory is categorized under ordinary hazard which is carpet factory coding factory so the solution is very straightforward you have an area so 20 times 10 which is equals to 200 meters cube uh, square and then for the sprinkler head arrangement spacing requirement because we know that this is at ordinary hazard so it's at 12 meters square so 200 divided by 12 you have about 16.67 you uh, round up then for this area and this usage of the building you require a minimum of 17 number of sprinkler so we just have all the information available and then to answer the question it's just a very straightforward or two line okay next is the uh, other fire active fire protection system in place this is the automatic carbon dioxide extinguishment system so instead of instead of having a sprinkler you can install a carbon dioxide extinguishment system so 
this will discharge carbon dioxide instead of water. So instead of water sprinkler, you have this carbon dioxide sprinkler. So it's mildly toxic. And then if you are to actually breathe it in, then it will be dangerous for people. Lah. So this one is not so common. Lah. You will most commonly be installed in a place where there is no, no people working in the area. So it's still suitable to be installed in electrical room, LV switch room, standby generator room, or all unoccupied uh, room that needs fire protection. So where water as extinguishing agent is not permissible. So this is class E. Lah. So for all the area which do not have people and there's electronic, electronic equipment where the sprinkler is not uh, permitted to be installed, this carbon dioxide sprinkler system should be installed. So there's this advantage which is good against all electronic components. And then they are non-combustible, they cannot conduct electricity and leave no residue. But there's a disadvantage of it being dangerous to people lah, if you breathe it in. So there is a sequence of activation for the CL2. First off is a first zone activation. So an alarm will ring and then everything will be shut off. So this is important, lah, this, all this step. So the first zone activation will notify any occupant in the room to get out of the room. Because if you're in the room and this CO2 activated, they are designed to keep spraying for about one minute to fight off the fire. And if you're in there, then you'll be very dangerous for the person, for the occupant inside. Lah. So that's why there's this first zone activation. So there'll be LED alarm indication, visual, and then there'll be a sound sound indication, which is an alarm bell. And then these two will be in place and the occupant are to be notified to get out of the room. And then the control system will shut up all the ventilation system. So for the area where the smoke happened, then once a certain amount of time passed after the first zone activation, then the second zone activation will activate so the alarm will still continue to sound, but a 60 second delay timer for the gas will be energized. So once 60 seconds has passed, then the CO2 will float the room. So there's a reason why the control system will want to shut off the ventilation system. You do not want to spray the whole room with CO2, but, had, but the CO2 you spray escape out of the room. That's why you want to treat and shut off all the ventilation so that the CO2 will still remain inside the room. So when you close off all of the ventilation in the room, you know that the any air will not escape out of the room. Then when you activate the CO2 extinguisher, then as the CO2 gas is filling up the room, then this will in terms remove the oxygen which fuels the fire. <clears throat> so this is the two steps, uh, two, two zone activation on how this carbon dioxide extinguishment system works. <clears throat> so the last is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the last. Yes, the last is the automatic fire detection and alarm system. So this one is to let you know that fire is happening. So alarm will be sound off to the remote control location. So how this alarm is being sound off and visually to the control room is through smoke detector, heat detector, flame detector. So any sort of detection against fire if it trigger, 
then it will actually send a signal to the system to ring, which is an alarm. And then for a more advanced system, if a hard fire were to happen, the firefighting firefighter or the bomba is actually notified straight away. So this is to reduce the time. This is to re reduce the time of delay for the firefighter to reach the firefighting seat, the fire seat. So the earlier they are notified, the they are, the earlier they are notified, the faster they will be able to reach the area and to fight the fire. If you are not familiar on how to use the fire extinguisher or the blanket, or you do not know how to fight a fire, then it is advisable to not fight it lah if you do not know how to fight a fire or how to operate the firefighting system. Okay, classes of sprinkler system. So there's a lot of selection of firefighting system depending on what sort of nature of the fire to be dealt with, the fire load, fire classification, the active involvement of the occupant, and then the ability of the occupant to leave the building. So based on all of these deep, uh, selection, different different firefighting systems should be installed. So these are all sprinkler system. Uh, this is a hydrant system. And this is the host reel system, the typical arrangement. Then this is a dry riser system. So you have a hose all the way to each of the floor, which is which is to be accessible by the bomba. And then this is a carbon dioxide execution system, typical arrangement. So it's something like a sprinkler. And then these are connected to a carbon dioxide tank. Then this is a sprinkler system, which you'll find uh, in places where occupants are allowed to walk around. Okay, so the selection of all of what type of firefighting system depends on what sort of occupant, what, what sort of usage of the building they are in. So this is the bylaw, this uh, hydrant system is required by law to be installed. And then you have an option of installing a wet riser or a dry riser. So this is for a high rise building and you will you'll mostly be located at a, a emergency staircase. This part and this part, this will be located at emergency escape. And then the you have an option to install this wet riser or a dry riser system into a building. And then for and then for a room which have a which normally do not have people occupying the room and there's electronic equipment, carbon dioxide execution system should be installed in a room. And then a sprinkler system should be installed in a place where there is normal occupancy lah, where have you have people walking around here and there. So all of these sort of all of these uh, firefighting system, they are required by law to be installed in commercial building. So it is not necessary to install all these fire protection system in a house. But in a case where you have a very large view up of the building, then it's required by law to install all this sprinkler system. So that's why you do not find your house to have this sprinkler system. Okay, so this is it for the firefighting system. If you have any question, you may ask now.